Now, um, I want to go back to the topic of testing yet again. This is the third time we're going back to it, uh, but it's the last time. So on this occasion, sorry, now just one second. So if I switch over to Moodle, and if we go into the automated testing section, uh, I want to look at web API testing, which is obviously timely because in the web app dev module, you're looking at web API development. And so we're going to look at how we might automate the testing of our web API. As I said at the very beginning of this module, at the beginning of the semester, the two modules are very much aligned and that's not by accident really. We've designed it that way. Uh, the nice thing though is that some of the tool set that we are already familiar with, in particular Maka and Chai, we're going to be reusing those uh, all over again so we don't have to get over that initial kind of barrier of how we structure our testing code. So it'll be these describe blocks and it blocks and before and after hooks. And uh, there will be one new library, all right, our framework that we'll be using, which will allow us to communicate with our web API over HTTP. I could have used Cypress because Cypress does support uh, HTTP communication, but it would be more common to use something other than Cypress for web API testing. And there are many of them, but uh, one of the popular ones is a framework called SuperTest. So we'll look at that in a minute. Um, now, before I start talking about that, though, I want to go back to something that I mentioned to you in the lab on Tuesday, which is that and this is by way of preparation for the second assignment. I know now we've only just submitted the first assignment and I'm already talking about the second assignment, but so be it. Uh, what you need to do is um, you need to go to this website here and you need to enroll on this student development pack. Now, the assumption is that you have a GitHub account whereby you are using your WIT email address as the uh, backup for that GitHub account. If you've been using a GitHub account that's linked to one of your own personal email addresses up to now, that's fine, but you need to go away and create another GitHub account that's linked to your WIT email address. Because when you enroll on this thing, on this GitHub student development pack, what you will be giving, uh, uh, what you'll be supplying as your application, if you like, is your WIT email address. And the people behind this initiative will verify that you have a GitHub account based on that email address. And uh, you will get accepted straight away, pretty much anyway. Now, what, what this uh, student development pack gives you is free or relatively free access to lots of cloud-based platforms. And they're all they're all listed here, actually. There's quite a lot of them. So a number of organizations and open source uh, projects have linked themselves to this initiative. Uh, and the idea behind it is obviously to allow students uh, to use some of these cloud-based services uh, for free, uh, provided you don't abuse the services. If you overuse them, then you do get charged eventually. Now, the one that we're interested in right now is this one here called Heroku. So uh, you will also, having enrolled on this student development pack, you will also need to go to this website and you will need to sign up for this Heroku uh, service. What Heroku will allow us to do is to deploy the web API that you are developing in the web app dev module. We be, will deploy it 
onto this Heroku cloud platform and thus making our web API accessible uh, over the web. And that will all be a part of the second assignment, but you need to do all of this in preparation for that. And also I will have a lab which will involve using this Heroku service in conjunction with GitLab. GitLab will be part of the GitLab CICD will be part of the second assignment as well. So that's all by way of uh, preparation for what remains on this module. Are there any questions about that, I wonder? Uh, just just to wrap it up though, when you when you sign up for this Heroku service as part of this sign up, you uh, you can actually um, you can actually indicate that you are registered on the GitHub Student Development Pack, and by doing that, Heroku the Heroku service will actually check then that you have actually enrolled on that student development pack. It'll do that uh, in an automated way. And uh, if it successfully uh, verifies that you are enrolled on the GitHub student development pack, it will give you free access to this Heroku service. Uh, I think what it actually does is it gives you $13 per month for a period of a year free um, uh, free tier access. Now, again, if you overuse Heroku, then if you go beyond the $13 per month usage, then you will be charged. So you do need to provide a credit card when you're enrolling on this Heroku service, just as with the GitLab service. Right, that's that. Back to the topic of today, which is Web API testing. So we've talked about unit testing, we've talked about end-to-end -end testing, and now we're talking about web API testing. The old fashioned name for web API testing because web APIs weren't always part of our application architecture. The old name might've been integration testing or subsystem testing. Because if you think about it, if you're talking about a full web app, the web API is just a part of that web app. It's a subsystem within the entire system, hence the name. But, uh, okay, so we're focused on API testing. And when we're always talking about testing, we're talking about the target of our test. So when we were talking about unit testing, the target was uh, that unit that we were testing, whether that be a class or a function. When we were talking about end-to-end -end testing, the target of our testing was the entire application or the entire system. In the case of API testing, web API testing, clearly the target is the web API itself. And as I've mentioned before, um, we kind of treat the web API as this kind of black box idea. And again, if you remember the 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 the, um, the thinking there is just regard your web API as something that accepts inputs and returns an output. So the inputs in this case would be a HTTP request. Perhaps the request might contain a payload. If it's a HTTP POST request to a particular endpoint, we include a payload with that request. That's our input. The output will be the response returned by the web API. Uh, whether that response will include a payload as well, or some data, or it may just be a status code and a message. Uh, that's the output. But we we don't want to get tied up with looking at the internals of our web API as to how it actually produces the output. We treat it as something, as a black box that has a specification where the specification is comprised of what are the different endpoints, what are the different types of HTTP requests that we can make to it, i.e. get put, post, delete, and what is the structure of the response that it returns back. We don't care how it produces the response. Not when we're doing web API testing. We may indeed have some unit testing uh, prior to web API testing where the unit testing would be concerned with testing particular uh, 
parts within your web API, you know, particular functions or whatever. So that's why we treat it using this kind of black box approach. Um, as well, I'm saying down here that, okay, uh, this is kind of linked to this black box idea that when, when we are doing web API testing, then we're only concerned with what the API does rather than how it does it. The how would be more concerned with, uh, would be more of a focus when we're doing unit testing of parts of our web API. So, you know, the language is the same as before. Down here, I'm talking about, you know, the web API may well and is very often communicating with a database. So maybe the database is part of our focus when we are doing web API testing. And I'll come back to that idea in a moment. Or the web API may be communicating with another web API. Well, in that case, all we're interested in is, does the other API just do what it's supposed to do? We, we're not necessarily focused on testing. Well, sorry, we, we kind of assume that the other API is fully tested and is behaving as um, as required. We shouldn't be concerned with testing that other a a API because that's external to the web API that we are focused on. Testing principles, all the same as before. So we can still talk about the notion of normal boundary and error test cases when we're testing a web API. The normal would be, you know, uh, well, let's say the boundary. The boundary would be, for example, if a particular endpoint in our web API accepts a post request where the post request includes a body, and maybe there are certain properties within that body that have a value where there are upper and lower limits acceptable for that particular value, well, then perhaps we should test whether we can specify a value just on that boundary, be it upper or lower limit, just outside the boundary, all of that kind of stuff. Or there may be a boundary related to the length of a particular property of the payload, all of the usual kind of stuff. And so we should test to make sure that our web API accepts requests where the body, proper a property of the body is just on the boundary and everything behaves as expected. Uh, or if it's outside the boundary, then we're veering into the kind of error handling side of our web API. And you, you know from the web API development that you're doing in the other module, that error handling is a very important part uh, of your programming of the web API. And therefore we should test that our error handling is working as we expect it and require it to work based on the specification. So all of that still uh, comes into play. This given when then, you know, that kind of mindset can can um, can be useful. The given might be, you know, given that the database has a certain set of records in a particular table, when we make a HTTP get put request, then we should get a particular response. So, you know, that kind of way of structuring your different test cases can be useful. Test isolation is, is obviously still very important. And the, oh yeah, here I'm talking about the test targets state. Now, what does state correspond to when you're talking about a web API? Well, nine times out of 10, the state refers to the actual database that's linked to the web API. If a particular uh, endpoint accepts a HTTP POST request, for example, and the idea is that the web API should make some change to the database as a result of that POST request, then as part of our test, we should check to ensure that the database has changed as expected. Um, so that's where state becomes a really key issue in relation to web API testing. The silent principle is always still important. Don't have, you know, console.logs are fine when we're debugging, but we kind of minimize 
the amount of console.logging that's performed by our web API uh, and certainly by our tests. Don't, we don't have, we don't like console logs scattered all over our test code. Okay, when we're debugging, but not uh, when we've cleaned up our test cases. So nothing new here, just all applying it to a different context. Uh, all I'm doing here really is listing, you know, because expectations, again, is part of uh, what we're thinking about when we're developing uh, web API tests, because as I said, we're taking that kind of black box approach. So maybe as part of our tests, we're, we want to, to a state an expectation about the the status code that's returned by the web API, or maybe we are concerned with the HTTP headers in the response that comes back from the web API may not have been something that you would have focused a lot on in the web app dev module, but uh, in more real life situations, the actual headers that are included in the response can be significant to uh, can be a significant part of the web api's kind of behavior and how it should behave so we in our expectations in our test cases we should have a way of examining the http headers in the response here i'm talking about uh if the response from the web api includes some sort of payload or data then maybe we we need to be examine the structure or the schema of that response. Make sure it's as as specified in the specification for the web API. The actual payload itself, you know, the values within the payload. So this stuff down here is kind of normal stuff that you would expect, uh, but uh, maybe these are important as well. Uh, if I just finish the list, our specific keys. You know, if, if the response has a payload, then not only does it have the right structure, are uh, the keys in the the key value, the keys in the in the structure, because the structure is going to be more than likely a JSON structure. Uh, are there specific keys within that structure that we would require the response to include? And finally, then I'm talking about the uh, the the data store has the data store been modified as uh, in accordance with the specification so these are the kinds of questions or expectations that we would like to be able to express in our api testing code clearly when we are testing a web api the uh, asynchronous nature of the web api is significant we've had that when we were doing the end to end testing uh, but it's also an issue here, clearly. So, um, so our whatever testing framework that we're going to use, hopefully it will take that into account and we don't have to do any kind of elaborate coding on our part to allow for that asynchronous uh, aspect of the of our target. So we are going to be using Mocha, uh, and there's just one or two little things about Mocha that we need to be aware of. I could have mentioned this way, way back, but uh, the first thing I'm saying here is uh, it's it's unusual, but uh, in a kind of a, in a kind of um, uh, abstract kind of sense, if you've got a an it block and there are no expectation statements within that it block. You know, there's no, you don't have to have expectation statements within an it block. It would be very unusual not to, but it's not mandatory. You won't get a kind of a compile time error from Marcus saying we can't run this test because you don't have any expectation statements. But if there is an it block with no expectation statements in it, then as you might expect, that test case is going to pass overall. There's nothing unusual about that. Uh, where there is something unusual, though, and we wouldn't expect it is if the target within our it block here that we're examining, if it's an asynchronous target, then there's something unusual. So 
here, what I'm doing here in this little excerpt is uh, I'm simulating uh, an asynchronous aspect to my target. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the set timeout function that comes with the JavaScript runtime. Uh, I'm sure you've used it before. What the set timeout function does is, or what you pass it is, you pass it a callback. So you can see here I'm passing it a callback. And uh, you pass it an integer. And the way the set timeout works is it will invoke your callback function after this period of time has elapsed. So it's 400 milliseconds. And that's really uh, kind of an asynchronous aspect to this it block here because our callback is not going to be executed immediately. It's not going to be executed synchronous, synchronously. It's going to be executed asynchronously. Asynchronous simply means it's going to be executed sometime in the future. And specifically, I'm telling it to execute it 400 milliseconds uh, in the future. Now, within my, uh, my, my callback here that I'm passing to set timeout, I do have an expectation statement. You've seen this before when I was talking about unit testing. And what's the expectation statement uh, evaluating? It's evaluating this foo variable which I've initialized to false here, and it's checking to see is the foo variable equal to true. Now, clearly that expectation statement is going to fail. Therefore, you would expect that this overall test is going to fail, but in fact, it's not. It's actually going to pass. And it's going to pass because Mocha does not wait for this asynchronous target to complete. In other words, it doesn't wait for this expectation statement to execute. If there were other statements within this callback, uh, it just won't wait for them. And it's going to report back to us as to what the result of this overall test is. It's going to report back before our callback has executed and therefore before this expectation statement has evaluated. And I said up here that if a an it block has no expectation statements, then by default it passes. And though if, therefore, um, effectively, this it block here does not have any expectation statement that is executed before Mocha reports on the overall result of the test. Okay, it has an expectation statement here, but that's actually going to execute after Mocha has reported back to us, telling us what was the outcome of the test. Uh, and, so for the, and therefore, from Marcus' point of view, the outcome of this test case is it has passed overall because it has not evaluated. Marka has not actually executed any expectation statement um, before it actually reported back to us. So that's clearly a problem. How do we get Marka to essentially wait until this code here has executed? And here's the answer. So the default behavior I'm seeing from Maka is that it does not wait for any kind of asynchronous code or asynchronous target with an init block, which is what we had with that set timeout on the previous slide. It, it just won't wait for that. Um, and it's going to report back the outcome of the test uh, immediately. So expectations uh, are executed in an asynchronous kind of target, expectations are executed after Maka has reported the result of the test. Here's how we get Maka to actually wait. So uh, if you you can see here my it block, and I pass my it block a string as before, and I pass it a callback function. Now, up to now, the callback function hasn't had any argument, but there is a default argument that the you can provide in the callback that's linked to the it, uh, it block. And it, it doesn't matter what name you give that parameter, but by convention, we call it, uh, we call the parameter done. Now done is actually going to be bound to a function at runtime by Maka. We don't have to worry about how do we initialize done. The done, uh, variable is bound to a function at runtime by Maka itself. 
and we can actually call the done function within our test code. And the way, and what, what does Marco use this done function for? Well, essentially what Marco will guarantee is it won't report the overall result of our test case until this done function has been invoked explicitly by our test case. So I'll repeat that. Marker will not report the overall result of our test case until the done function has been invoked somewhere within our test case. And so I'm invoking done here after this expectation statement has been evaluated and therefore I achieve my objective, which is I don't want Marker to report the overall result of this test case until this function has been called, in other words, until this expectation statement has been evaluated. And so now, uh, what is the expectation statement actually check? It's checking to see whether uh, foo is equal to true. I've initialized it to false here. So clearly this expectation statement is going to fail and therefore my overall test is going to fail. And that's what I would have uh, expected based on how I've coded this. On the right, just another example, I've initialized foo to true. Here I'm evaluating, is it true? That expectation statement is going to evaluate to true. It is the only expectation statement. Therefore, I'd expect this overall test to pass. And indeed, that is what is will happen. Again, I'm using the done uh, function here to essentially tell marker, wait until this line has executed before you evaluate the overall result of this test case and then report back to the the tester on the command line so um so that's the mechanism that marker provides us with uh, to allow us to use marker for testing asynchronous targets Right. Um, there is a second problem, though. So you're, if your target is asynchronous and we're waiting for it to respond back to an invocation, then, and okay, Maka is going to wait until we eventually call this this special done function within our it block, but it 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 won't wait kind of forever. Maka has a timeout, a default timeout, which you can configure. And if um, if you don't invoke the done function within the timeout period, then Maka will just fail straight away. And what you'll get is a message like this coming back from, from Maka. It essentially is kind of telling you that it has timed out. Um, and by default, the timeout period is 200 milliseconds. So you can see here, back to my little example where I'm using set timeout to kind of simulate an asynchronous nature to my test case. I've set the timeout to be 400 milliseconds. That means that Maka will wait for 200 milliseconds, but because the done function has not been invoked yet, it won't be invoked for another 200 milliseconds, uh, 400 in total. Uh, but Maka won't wait for the 400 milliseconds. It's actually going to report back a timeout uh, after 200 milliseconds has elapsed. Now, that's an easier problem to solve because we can tell Maka what we want our timeout period to be. Uh, by uh, We can do it from the command line. We could also do it by means of a configuration file. So here I'm setting the timeout to be uh, 5,000 milliseconds. Now, a word of warning, don't go abusing this uh, in your assignment when we eventually come to assignment two. So leave it as its default 200 milliseconds and only if you're having issues with running your tests and getting lots of timeout errors, only then should you think about changing the timeout to something higher than 200 milliseconds. But uh, we can actually, but uh, we, we can anyway control the timeout period, or uh, we can configure the timeout period to allow for a particularly slow asynchronous uh, 
web API that we might be testing. So um, that's that's that. Can I just go back to the previous slide? Did I miss anything there? Uh, no, that's okay. So there are the two issues anyway. The uh, the timeouts are important because now we're testing something that's asynchronous in nature, and the use of this special done function, which will allow us to tell Maka to wait until our asynchronous target has responded back with a response, and we have evaluated that response by means of our expectation statements. So uh, with all that uh, knowledge, then we can now start focusing in on testing web APIs uh, specifically. So as I've kind of already mentioned, we're going to be using Maka, we're going to be using Chai, and the third library we're going to be using is, uh, that I've chosen to use anyway, is Supertest. And what Supertest is, is it's simply HTTP client, so it will allow us to make HTTP requests. And it also comes with a, an expectation kind of syntax uh, built into it, where the expectation syntax was specifically designed for making expectation statements related to web API endpoints or web API targets. Um, so what this uh, super test library or framework, I suppose it's either or, it'll allow us to easily compose HTTP requests and send them to our target, to our web API. It allow us to make some expectation, express some expectation statements. Now we will still be using Chai as well to make more fine-grained expectation statements as you'll see. So here's how we use SuperTest. Uh, so SuperTest uh, essentially just provides one key function called the request function. And also what I'm importing here is I'm importing a reference to my Express app. Okay, so this would be, you know, what you're developing in the web API or in the web app dev module. So I do have a reference to my Express app within my test uh, code. And I don't have to explicitly start the Express app separately. That's what's nice about SuperTest. It will actually kind of start it up itself uh, within its runtime environment. That's just by the way. So here's how I make a request to our my web API. Uh, I just pass it a reference to the Express app. So this is either a uh, reference to the Express app that's going to be running locally, or as I'm saying down here at the very bottom, it could actually be a, a URL if the web app is deployed to the cloud and you want to test it in its deployment from its deployment environment or it could be just an ordinary node HTTP server and really all an express app is. An express app, as you know, runs on top of the node HTTP server uh, platform. So um, there's no surprise with that, but we, we, could, we could actually kind of assign this variable here. It doesn't matter what you call the variable. We could assign it a URL and therefore our passing to request here is a, is a URL and it will still use that to make its HTTP request. And then we're using this meta chaining kind of style with this request function. So the way you interpret this line here is, I want to make a HTTP get request to my endpoint. Uh, this is the particular, um, this is the particular endpoint within the web API uh, that I'm targeting. The set method allows me to set HTTP request headers, and you can invoke set any number of times because there may be a number of request headers that you want to set. Note now it's setting the request headers, not the response headers. Um, and finally, uh, what I'm doing down here then is uh, evaluating the response. So the first couple of lines are about composing my HTTP request and as well, uh, sending that request to my particular endpoint. Uh, 
So the request function will take care of all of that. Uh, the expect part here, that's obviously not going to be executed until the response comes back. So there's implicitly kind of a delay between this and this actually executing, but that's fine. We don't have to worry about that. That's what's nice about the super test. Here, what I'm doing is I'm evaluating the status code that's contained in the response that comes back. And the end statement then is where you can have more fine-grained expectation statements on the body of the response that comes back. You can see here that the end, uh, you have to pass it a, a function, which we generically refer to as a callback function. The second argument of that function is going to be bound to the body of the response that comes back. And so inside here, then, we can have various expectation statements using the chai library to examine the body. And you'll see that in uh, the lab that I'll provide with this. Uh, that's, that's going to be next week. So that's how we program a HTTP GET request. And this would just be contained within an init block, as you'll see. For a POST request, same kind of stuff, except now we're using the POST method instead of the GET method. The SEND uh, method is where we can, uh, is where we specify the, the body or the payload of the post. So if we were, let's say, adding a new movie, in here, we would have our new movie object that we want to add to our database. And then the rest is as before. Uh, here, we're evaluating the status code in the response that comes back. And here is where we would evaluate the body of the response that comes back. Uh, in this example, oh yeah, in this example, I'm just showing you that inside here is where you have more uh, specific expectation statements using the child library for examining the body. So if we just uh, step our way through it, and uh, I've put it within an it block in this case, and typically the it block is only going to have one statement within it, this, this request statement. But of course, as we see, the request statement has a lot packed into it. So it looks like we're making a get request to this endpoint so it looks like we are requesting some movies from our web API. We're setting our we're setting our accept request header. We are here. What we're saying is we're evaluating one of the response headers. We're expecting the content type header to be included in the response, and we're expecting it to be to contain JSON within. The, the value associated with that response header. In other words, essentially what we're saying here is that we expect the web API to return JSON data as its response type. We expect the response code to be 200. And here now I'm actually looking at the response body and I'm making some specific uh, expectation statements around that. The details of this aren't important in the example. We will be doing it in the lab anyway. And of course, we are calling our done. Um, that's a very important point, actually. We're calling our done special function at the very end of the end, at the very bottom of the end block within this chain of method calls, where done is initialized up here by Maka for us. So it looks kind of complicated initially, but you'll get the hang of it. Uh, in this example, oh yeah, sometimes the response that comes back from the web API, uh, that the payload response is quite simple in structure. And if that's the case, if I go back to the previous slide, if that's the case, then we don't need this kind of elaborate stuff here at all. We don't need the end uh, method at all. We can actually finish it off with a an expect method. And in the expect method, in this case, we pass it two arguments. The first argument will be the full structure of the body of the response. And the second argument is just for the purpose of calling our done uh, function. So what I'm saying in this example, I'm making a get request to this endpoint 
and it looks like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm actually doing some error checking. I'm passing it an invalid movie ID. And in that case, I expect my web API to return a 404 status code. And I expect the body of the response to simply be a data structure where there is one key called message. And that's the value assigned to the message key. Yeah. So uh, I could have done, I could have expressed all of this using the end approach, but uh, it, it's a bit of overkill really. So this will work as well. And you'll see an example of that in the lab. Now, there, there are two ways of programming our request, uh, our super test code. We can code it in the way that I've been showing you up to now using essentially callbacks. There's lots of callbacks and nesting of callbacks, or we can use the promise-based approach. And to be honest with you, the promise-based approach is, is probably more common uh, these days, and it's also slightly cleaner. So here's an example of using the promises-based programming style using the super test framework. So the key things to note is that you are returning, whereas if I go back, sorry, now to the previous slide, there's no explicit return statement here. Whereas when you're using the, the promise-based approach, there is an explicit return statement. Essentially what you're returning out of this it block is you're returning a promise, but Maka knows how to handle those promises. Uh, so we needn't worry about that. So we return, and then the rest is much the same as before, except for we don't use the end function anymore. We use the then function to finish off our HTTP statement, if you like. And it's in the then part, that's where we put our more fine-grained expectation statements about the structure of the body of the response that comes back if there is an elaborate payload response that comes back. So replace, replace, sorry, now replace end, replace end with then and have an explicit return statement. That's essentially it from a pure syntax point of view. Also, I'm saying over here, we're not using done anymore. So that's out of the picture. So it's a slightly cleaner programming model. Uh, similarly, if the body of the response that comes back is fairly uh, simple in structure, uh, in that case, we don't really need to use the, we don't need to use the then clause at all. We can just have a an expect clause at the very bottom of our request. And again, we the, the expect here, you pass it the, the exact structure of the object that you're expecting in the response that comes back from our web API. So again, it's slightly cleaner, arguably. This is the final slide. Uh, Maka, Maka has been around for quite a while, so it, it, it's very well regarded in, in the industry. Uh, it's very robust, but it, it is slightly behind the curve in terms of modern JavaScript. So, uh, but it's getting better. <laughs> um, so what you will see me doing in the labs, not necessarily next week's lab, but the one after that is you'll see me having to compile our Maka code using the Babel tool, compile it to, uh, sorry, we, we can write it in ES6 syntax, but we have to compile it back to ES5 syntax using Babel and then, and then run the ES5 version of our tests. I mean, Babel does all of that for us, but we just need to be aware of the fact that uh, we may need to do that. Similarly, we will be compiling our web API code, which will be written in modern JavaScript, we will be compiling it back to ES5 JavaScript uh, using Babel as well. And that's it really. Um, so apart from super test, everything is as before, and it's just a case of familiarizing yourself with the 
the super test um, programming model, as I call it. And there are two options. We can either use the callback approach, which requires us to use this special done function, or we can use the promises based programming model, which is cleaner and arguably at this stage anyway, um, is more, more popular, I would say. There is an, an async await version as well. Uh, not sure if I use that in the lab. I don't think I do, but uh, you can use async await, but that has to be transpiled back to ES5 uh, if, you, if you do use that programming style. Right, um, that's it. Now I just have a, a minute or, uh, well, I've got a couple of minutes, but so after, so, so there'll be a lab next week on this stuff. Um, and that'll give you an opportunity to familiarize yourself with, uh, with this whole um, super test framework. Sorry, just give me one second. Yeah, and after that, then we come back to CICD again, and it's CICD in the context of Web API. We, if you remember, we didn't really do any continuous deployment or continuous delivery uh, or continuous deployment when we were doing our, for, for the first assignment, we were just using the CI part of GitLab. Now in the second assignment, we will bring in continuous deployment and continuous delivery, which is why we need that Heroku web service. So the second assignment will be about developing a CICD pipeline for a web API context, which will involve using Mocha, Chai, Supertest, GitLab, Heroku. And I, I have to show you how we automate the deployment of a web API to Heroku. There are tools, there are command line tools that uh, will allow us to do that. And we essentially program our CICD pipeline to automatically deploy our web API after it has run all the web API tests in GitLab. Uh, we can get GitLab to deploy our web API up to Heroku for us. And hence we'll have uh, continuous deployment stroke continuous delivery. That's the plan. And we will look at how we do that continuous deployment, continuous delivery. Uh, in next week's lecture, I'll show you how to do it. I won't have a kind of a long lecture on it as such. It's, it's just a case of showing you how to do it because you, you, you know what the concept of continuous delivery, continuous deployment is. So all we need to know is how do we actually do it? Um, and then that's it, really. Then we, we've kind of covered the module in its entirety. So I expect to be finished. This is week 10. Um, you will have a lab okay in week 12. It's not a lab that you have to hand up, though. The last lab that you need to hand up will be next week's lab, which will be linked to Web API testing. That's the final lab. There will be a lab after that. But the lab after that is by way of preparation for the second assignment. But I, I talk about that maybe um, next week. You won't be handing up the second assignment until the first of January, so you've got plenty of time to work on it. Right, that's it for now. Unless you've got any questions for me. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Um, I was just wondering uh, when are we going to get the results for the first assignment? I know <laughs> it's a bit, it's a bit early to ask. I know, but yeah, uh, I soon. I hope. <laughs> yeah, no bother. Answer, but yeah, I would I, I'd probably start uh, correcting them early next week, I'd say. That's no problem. Perfect. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Nothing else. All right. I'll talk to you later. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye now.